A court watches the moment DNA evidence was taken which allegedly linked the Claremont killings to Bradley Edwards. One hundred senators sworn in as jurors for Donald Trump's impeachment trial. Survival against the odds a little girl and her faithful puppy become the talk of the town. And band player Willie Rioli resumes training ahead of a finding on alleged urine tampering. Good evening, Pamela Medlin with ABC News. The Claremont serial killings trial has heard graphic details of the post-mortem examinations on the bodies of Jane Rimmer and Kira Glennon more than 20 years ago, at a time when procedures were less stringent and DNA technology was in its infancy. The court was taken through the processes step by step by a mortuary technician who'd helped collect samples from the bodies. Those samples would become critical evidence in the case against Bradley Edwards. Robert McDermott oversaw thousands of post-mortem examinations in the 18 years he managed the state mortuary, including those of Jane Rimmer and Kira Glennon, after their bodies were found dumped in bushland in 1996 and 1997. Mr McDermott's job was to assist forensic pathologists as they examined the victims, performing the critical role of collecting samples, including fingernail clippings from Kira Glennon, upon which the prosecution alleges Bradley Edwards' DNA was found. The witness was shown footage of the post-mortem examination. It was screened from the public gallery and Bradley Edwards removed his glasses as the video was played. In the audio, Mr McDermott could be heard struggling to obtain the fingernail samples using a pair of scissors that were too big for the task, saying, it's too hard, Laurie. I can't get him, Laurie. I can't get him. The man he was speaking to was former Path West forensic biologist Lawrence Webb. The state claims fibres from Jane Rimmer's and Kira Glennon's hair came from a pair of Telstra work pants and the interior of Edward's work-issued car, a Holden VS Commodore station wagon. But the defence has raised doubts over the sources of those fibres, saying they could have come from any number of people. When Mr McDermott, the mortuary technician, was asked what car he drove at the time, he replied, an old Commodore. Bradley Edwards denies the murder charges against him. His trial will resume on Monday when it enters its seventh week. Charlotte Hamlin, ABC News. For just the third time in history, an impeachment trial of an American president has begun in the United States Senate. This morning, Donald Trump was formally summoned to answer two charges. And a key figure in the when the scandal went public with more damaging claims about the Commander-in-Chief's conduct. North America correspondent James Glenday reports. This was a moment that'll live forever in America's history books. The head of the country's highest court was sworn in. So help you God. I do. So too the senators who will effectively serve as the jury. Do you solemnly swear? And the Democratic politicians prosecuting the case against Donald Trump formally put the 45th president on trial. You could feel the weight of the moment. I saw members on both sides of the aisle visibly gulp. The Commander-in-Chief has now been summoned to answer two charges. The first states he abused the powers of the presidency by pressuring Ukraine to announce investigations that could have helped him politically ahead of this year's election. The second alleges he then tried to cover it all up. This thing is a big hoax. It's a big hoax. Uh, we call it, uh, this is the current hoax. But former members of the president's orbit keep contradicting his blanket denials. Lev Parnas, a Soviet-born businessman who's facing criminal charges, says he worked with Mr Trump's personal lawyer to pressure Ukrainian officials. President Trump knew exactly what was going on. Uh, he was aware of all of my movements. And this morning, a federal watchdog accused the president's team of breaking the law by withholding military aid from Kiev as leverage. Embarrassing as those developments may be for the White House, they're almost certainly not going to change the outcome of this historic trial. Mr Trump's Republican colleagues control the numbers in the Senate and senior administration officials here again today declared they're hopeful the president will be acquitted quickly, perhaps within two to three weeks. James Glenday, ABC News, Washington. 
Deputy Nationals Leader Bridget McKenzie is staring down the prospect of a parliamentary inquiry into her involvement in a grants program which handed $100 million to sporting clubs around the country. An investigation has found it appeared to favour marginal coalition seats ahead of the election, as well as electorates the government wanted to win. But the senator is refusing to step down, insisting everything was above board. His political reporter, Matthew Doran. Out of Canberra, yeah, but still in the spotlight. What? How do you justify your choices here? The Deputy Nationals leader can't escape questions about her handling of the contentious community sports grants program. All local members, Labor, uh, Liberal, National Party, Independent, appreciated the investment into their local clubs. She made political decisions. Oh, Bridget, how are you going? An Auditor General's report has raised serious questions about the integrity of the grants process, finding the then Sports Minister ignored ignored advice from Sport Australia and gave millions of dollars to clubs not originally earmarked for cash. Every single project that received funding was eligible to receive it. Analysis of the grants show the most marginal seats which received the most funding included Boothby in South Australia, Corangamite and Indi in Victoria, Eden Monero in New South Wales and Dawson in North Queensland. One of the successful clubs there is North Queensland Football, which received more than $360,000 to improve its Townsville facilities. We don't get involved with the, any sort of politics. We're here to uh, grow the game. The prestigious Mossman Rowing Club on Sydney's North Shore was given half a million dollars in April. It didn't help the local member get over the line at the May election and his successor's assessment. We just seem to have this focus on personal gain um, and the moral compass is, just seems to be lost. The government argues Labor electorates also benefited greatly. If a minister wants to cover themselves and take out some insurance, they'll give a couple of grants in electorates from the other side. You can't tell me one tennis club is more meritorious than another. But therein lies the problem, with the Minister and her office using their own criteria to award some of these grants, the allegation is they have deemed some clubs more deserving. And when politicians return to the capital next month, you can expect to see the Senate attempt to launch its own inquiry into this saga. Australian people are sick and tired of pork barrelling by politicians and um, looking after their own nest egg. And they'll be hoping she cracks under parliamentary pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Canberra. More details have emerged about the remarkable survival story of a three-year-old girl lost on a flooded station in the remote Pilbara for 24 hours. Today, the family of little Matilda is also celebrating their hero puppy, which stayed with her until help arrived. A tale of survival against the odds. On social media, the family of three-year-old Matilda lavished praise on her Jack Russell puppy, Wolfie. He was found with the little girl, both of them wet and muddy, perched on the bank of a creek almost 24 hours after wandering away from their home on a remote pastoral station in the East Pilbara. The local station holders around that area immediately donated their helicopters. Police from Nullagine, Marble Bar... Uh, and Newman immediately deployed out there. More than 35 people were involved in the search on Narina Downs, performed almost entirely from the air because of heavy flooding. The helicopters were just our only real source of ability to search properly. I know a number of our police officers are waiting in um, waist-deep water. The police air wing was sent, but mostly it was aircraft from other stations and mining companies, BHP and Roy Hill, which swept across the wide bushland. Their ability to help us for food, um, landing strips, airstrips, helicopters to, to put people in and out of the station, I was amazed how well it came together. But in Port Hedland, the SES had a major setback even before they could begin to search. We rocked up to our headquarters, ready to pack our vehicles, ready for deployment at 6, six o'clock, only to find that the building had been uh, broken into and um, sort of ransacked. A website fundraiser has been launched to replace equipment worth thousands of dollars. In the meantime, police say the local community is elated with Matilda's rescue and the loyalty of her puppy is the talk of the town. 
With the dog Wolfie, he wouldn't leave Matilda's side. It's, it's really um, that bond that's unbreakable. The RSPCA says Wolfie may be eligible for a rare bravery award. Already dubbed the goodest boy, the pup will first need to be nominated for yet another accolade. Emily Peace, ABC News. To finance now, confirmation that China's economy has been weakened by the trade war failed to dampen enthusiasm for Australian shares. The market kicked on, climbing further into record territory. Here's Philip Lasker. It's not only the bushfires that have attracted world attention, our all-conquering stock market is turning heads as well. Only two negative days this month so far. That's the best streak in more than two years. Not even confirmation that China had recorded its weakest economic growth in 29 years could derail the Australian market. This was the expected confirmation that the trade war had made its mark. China's GDP result weighed on other markets in the region, but Australia took its lead from Wall Street. Tech sector shares rallied in the US with Alphabet, owners of Google, the newest trillion dollar juggernaut, joining Apple and Microsoft as the biggest companies on Wall Street. IT stocks like Appen are also behind the Aussie market's record run. But so are telcos and healthcare stocks, not the traditional banking and mining giants that usually define the market. There were more climate casualties today. Agricultural supplies company New Farm was smashed after warning its profits could be halved by drought and offshore competition. Rio Tinto reported a 3% drop in iron ore shipments last year. Here are some recent indicators of the bushfire fallout. In Sydney, from mid-December to mid-January, the number of rooms available increased, but demand and revenue fell. It was much worse outside Sydney, though. Within two hours' drive of the city centre, revenue dived more than 10%, which is a big hit. There's about $2 million in lost revenue in Sydney and surrounds so far. Not much happening on the currency front. The Australian dollar continues to hover around 69 US cents. And that's finance. Five countries whose citizens were killed when Iranian forces shot down a passenger plane have called for Tehran to pay compensation to the victims' families. Iran has admitted one of its missiles was responsible for the disaster, but it's under pressure to do more for the investigation and help identify and repatriate the victims. Middle East correspondent Adam Harvey reports from Beirut. The foreign ministers from five nations mourn their citizens killed when a Ukrainian plane was shot down. The ministers from Canada, Britain, Ukraine, Sweden and Afghanistan want Iran to make amends. Iran's belated admission of guilt is not enough for the families and friends of the 176 people on board. When you accept full responsibility, there's consequences coming from that, and that's what we're going to be pursuing. The foreign ministers are demanding that their experts and diplomats take part in the investigation. And they say Iran should compensate the victims' families. Compensation flows directly from the full admission of responsibility by the Iranian government. While hoping to stitch together cooperation on the plane investigation, European governments are also watching the Iran nuclear deal unravel. Since the US killed its top general, Iran has vowed to ramp up activities meant to be curtailed by the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, including uranium enrichment. Today, as I stand here in front of you, we have no limits on nuclear energy, absolutely none. The European signatories to the nuclear deal say Iran is out of line and they've begun a process that could result in new sanctions being slapped on Tehran. Now the Europeans have decided in order to hide their inability to perform, to uh, take those measures. I don't think they have any uh, standing in JCPOA to do that. The US and its allies hope that increasing the pressure on Iran will somehow make it less dangerous. But so far, that's not happening. The Middle East is less safe than ever, and the downing of Flight 752 is an example of what can go wrong in a more volatile region. Adam Harvey, ABC News, Beirut. 
Prince Harry has attended his first public engagement since announcing he'll be stepping back from senior royal duties. The Duke of Sussex hosted the draw for next year's Rugby League World Cup and met children in the gardens of Buckingham Palace. Details of his new role are still unclear, but the Queen has said she wants a final decision within days. The Duke will reportedly stay in the UK for meetings next week before he rejoins wife Meghan and son Archie in Canada. A 59-year-old surfer has been attacked by a shark in the New South Wales Illawarra region. The man was surfing with friends on Windang Beach when the shark attacked his left foot, biting it through to the bone. Fellow surfers helped him to shore and he was taken to hospital in a stable condition. It's unclear what species bit the man, but bull sharks are known to frequent the area. The beach was closed for the rest of the day. Lots of rain is falling across large parts of New South Wales. It lifted spirits, put some water into dams, helped on the fire grounds and even drenched koalas. But the downpours over water catchments haven't been huge. Pure, unbridled joy. Send it down, Huey! Farmer Bryce Chapman from The Hunter receives a drenching. Hey, girls, here's some rain to give you some feed. The rain is falling in many parts and it's been heavy. A little too wet for some koalas on the central coast, needing a rescue from the water, though the crocs didn't mind. Further north, dry creeks have started flowing again. Old creeks filling up. Areas hit hard by drought given a reprieve, and people are celebrating. This freshly dug dam in the Clarence Valley now has water in it. For this rain to come today has just been amazing. There's already a little puddle in the bottom of the dam and she's flowing in really well. They're also filling up in the central west. Water in our dam for the first time in four years. Unbelievable. You've got mud on the boots. How does that feel? Well, I mean, it lifts the spirit immediately. There's no question of that. Those who've had a little rain are hoping for more, like Alan Wood from Dry Creek near Musselbrook. We've never had any follow-up rain. I'm hopeful that this event will do something for us. In Sydney, coastal cliffs turned into waterfalls. Beaches were best avoided. Peak hour, a little slower than usual. Umbrellas were a must, or maybe not. The rain is expected to hang around over large parts of New South Wales for a number of days. And that's good news for a state which has recently seen so many bushfires and a lingering drought. I think it might be much better for the fires and the trees to help it regrow. A much needed soaking, a long time in the making. Jonathan Hare, ABC News, Sydney. A bushfire on the south coast of New South Wales came perilously close to destroying the former home of the famous Australian artist Arthur Boyd. The painter gave his historic property Bundanon to the nation in 1993 and with it a significant art collection which includes not only his own works but also Picasso and Sidney Nolan. One of Australia's most acclaimed painters, the late Arthur Boyd, adored the Shoalhaven River home for much of his later life. His Shoalhaven paintings are among his most sought after. They were some of the thousands which came under fire threat this summer. On the 3rd of January we realised that the flames were coming really close. They're only about a kilometre from the Bundanon homestead site and we obviously had a lot of artwork still here stored. Bundanon Trust made the unprecedented decision to move its most valuable artworks into city storage. All these Sydney Nolan uh, colonial pictures have all gone as well, so the house is pretty much empty. Hours later, fire swept through the property's outskirts. Now, the rest of the collection is being evacuated. The whole collection is 3,800 artworks uh, by Arthur Boyd, Boyd family members, uh, Boyd's uh, colleagues and so on, uh, uh, Sidney Nolan, Charles Blackman. This is Bundanen's fire vault, built to house artworks in the event of a bushfire. But given the intensity of the current season, it's no longer considered up to the task. Next month, construction will begin on a $30 million art gallery and storage at an adjoining property. 
It will be built subterranean, it will be underground, so the risk of fire will be eliminated, basically. The Bushfire Building Council of Australia says there is no best practice to protect the nation's cultural institutions, and the ferocity of this fire season has revealed their vulnerability. Bundanong will reopen to the public soon, but for at least the remainder of this fire season, most of its artworks will be elsewhere. Michaela Boland, ABC News. Bushfire affected towns in the Adelaide Hills got a boost today on their road to recovery. They've welcomed cyclists and supporters on the second stage of the women's tour down under. The ride into Woodside framed by ruins and a blackened landscape. Stage two of the women's tour brought excitement to a region rebuilding. Having the race up here is going to be another way that people outside of the local community can support um, the recovery process up here. The December fires tore through the hills, destroying homes, farms and wineries, including Tomich Wines, owned and run by three generations of the same family. We've suffered some pretty significant loss. Uh, 20 years of hard work here up in smoke. Almost half the vines were lost in the blaze. So that means no fruit for this year and possibly we'll have some fruit for next year. But there is a feeling of hope and rejuvenation. We're trying to preserve at least one or two buds down the bottom, Randall. But everything's lifted. We had the ladies tour come, come through today. Uh, it's, very, it's an exciting time in South Australia. While it was a barren landscape that greeted the tour riders through some of the hills, by the time they reached the finish line at Birdwood, they were flanked by spectators from all over. So much work and effort put into it. Defending Tour Down Under champion Amanda Spratt reclaimed the top spot as she crossed the finish line. After weeks of distress, the race is providing a chance for locals to get together and welcome back visitors into the region. It's nice to support the local communities as well, so we've been trying to spend money at the local shops. A key part of the region's recovery. We're all a bit on edge, as you can imagine, So, um, but there's been great support. And with the men's tour kicking off on Sunday, the event is providing the hills a welcome boost. Natasha Kalios, ABC News, Adelaide. Now to sport with Clint Thomas and Clint Ash Barty's finding form. She is. She was made to work for it today, Pamela, that's for sure. But Barty has moved through to tomorrow's final of the Adelaide International after defeating American Daniel Collins tonight. Barty was rusty in the first set and dogged by unforced errors as Collins claimed it 6-3. But the world number one regained her focus and raced through the second, claiming it 6-1 in just 28 minutes. The deciding set didn't start well for Collins, who was forced to call a medical timeout to deal with a sore back. She pushed Barty to a third set tiebreaker, but the Australian prevailed. Now we can get the Barty party started. It's, it's new beginnings. It's um, you know been five, six, seven weeks between matches for me, and um, you know I think Brisbane was tough. I, I didn't feel like I was quite sharp enough to to win those matches there, but it's been a lot of fun out here, and I'm, I feel like I'm getting better and better with each match. Barty plays a first round match at the Australian Open against Alessia Serenko on Monday night. The West Coast Eagles forward Willie Rioli has resumed training today on the terms of his provisional suspension. Rioli was suspended after allegedly providing Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority officials with a tampered sample last year. The club says training is permitted until the final determination of the allegations. It's a great opportunity for him to reconnect with our players and our club. Um, our main concern at the moment is his health and well-being. In a statement, Rioli said he was looking forward to returning to the club. Collingwood Ruckman Brody Grundy has signed a seven-year deal with the club. The two-time All-Australian Ruckman has agreed to stay with the Magpies until the end of the 2027 season. There's been speculation Grundy would return to his hometown of Adelaide as the South Australian would have been eligible for free agency at the end of this year. The 25-year-old chose to stay because of his relationship with Collingwood coach Nathan Buckley. Bucks was really the first person I told, sort of went around to his house and had a ham and cheese sandwich and told him that I was staying. So. Um, yeah, that, that's the sort of relationships that I have at the footy club and um, a big reason why I've decided to stay. Magpie stars Jordan Dugowie and Darcy Moore are both coming out of contract at the end of 2020, leaving Collingwood in a tricky salary cap position. OK, and that's Sport Enjoy Weekend. Pamela, I'll see you next week. Terrific. Thanks, Clint. Now to the weather with Arena Ceranic.
Good evening. It was quite a muggy day in Perth with some showers too, but really only a sprinkle, barely anything registered in the gauges. After a warm overnight low of 22.5 at quarter to four, the city climbed to 28.2 at midday. Right now it's 23 degrees. It was a warm night right across the southern half with most towns only dropping to the high teens or low 20s and daytime temperatures ranged from 20 in Albany to 37 in Kalgoorlie. Once again, Warburton had the highest max maximum in the state of 42 degrees, while Broome was the warmest overnight, only dipping to 30. Cloud associated with a broad trough has triggered showers and storms across northern and central parts of WA. The storms were severe in parts of the Wheatbelt and Goldfields, whipping up gusts of 80 kilometres per hour in Kalgoorlie this afternoon. Meanwhile, ex-tropical cyclone Claudia remains well offshore in the Indian Ocean, but clouds streaming out from the system brought showers to parts of the south, including including Perth. There's a chance of showers and storms over northern and eastern parts of WA overnight and tomorrow, and an onshore flow could bring some falls to the south coast, but it'll be dry elsewhere as a ridge of high pressure builds to the south. Interstate tomorrow, downpours will continue in parts of New South Wales and Queensland. Brisbane could get up to 80 millimetres of rain. Sydney is expecting up to 25. There's a slight chance of a shower in Canberra and Darwin. Sunshine is forecast for Melbourne, but the sun will be obscured by smoke haze. A cool 18 degrees in Hobart, mostly sunny, and 27 in Adelaide. Back to WA, showers and thunderstorms in the Kimberley and inland parts of the Pilbara and Gascoyne, with maxima mainly ranging in the mid to high 30s. There's a chance of storms through the goldfields once again, with a cool change in Kalgoorlie, a top of 28 there, a fairly mild day through central parts in general. There'll be some cloud about through the south, mostly over the south coast, where showers are possible. Daytime temperatures will hit the 20s everywhere except Albany, which is heading for a cool 19. A strong wind warning will be in place for the Perth local waters and the West Pilbara, Gascoyne, Geraldton, Lancelin, Perth and Bunbury Geograph coasts. Cloud clearing in Perth tomorrow with a top of 30 after a low of 18. Winds will be southeasterly, turning easterly in the evening up to 35 kilometres per hour. Winds on the local waters could get up to 30 knots in the afternoon and evening, prompting the strong wind warning. The swell will be between will be up to 1.5 metres. The sun will rise at 5.27 and set at 7.26. It'll be sunny for the rest of the weekend with fresh easterly winds on Sunday morning and a top of 30. Monday is looking like the hottest day of the outlook with 31, but much of next week will be mild. 25 the top on Tuesday and Wednesday, 26 on Thursday and then bouncing back up to 30 by this time next week. Pamela. Thanks, Irina. Nearly 4 million Australians have a disability, yet it's not often reflected on stage or screen. A group of artists, some with disabilities, is looking to change that with a groundbreaking theatre work. Theatre soaring to dizzying heights. For audiences of all ages and abilities to enjoy. Paralympian Paul Nanari takes centre stage in this groundbreaking contemporary art piece with his impressive aerial acrobatics. A lot of people don't know what to expect when I start climbing, so when I put my hand in a loop or my neck in a loop, like I, re I really think it um, changes, I guess, people's perception of what, what I can do and, more importantly, what people with disability more broadly can do. She conjured the clouds as playing at the Campbelltown Arts Centre as part of the Sydney Festival. It takes audiences on a journey of the senses, incorporating the taste of fairy floss, vibrations of the music and sign language to make for a more inclusive experience. I love the idea of gesture and dance and uh, the idea of communicating without language. You can actually communicate via the body in a very subtle way and Auslan is a way of doing that. Wiggles star Emma Watkins plays a young girl who meets magical creatures as she travels through a fairy tale world. She uses sign language throughout the piece. It's been wonderful to be involved in this production because every single person in the cast and crew has a different background and different abilities and different experiences too. So we have people that have performed for many years, you know, on the stage. She shares the stage with Hong Kong-born Elvin Lam, one of the few professional dancers in Australia who is deaf. And I want the audience to not think of me as just deaf. I want them to look and think of me as a performer in general. 
because Emma's with me as well. She can sign and she signs throughout the performance and she doesn't speak. So I feel like us together is quite a performance in itself. Making accessibility part of their aesthetic. Lydia Feng, ABC News, Sydney. And that's ABC News for now. I'll be back with you on Monday, but until then, have a great weekend. Good night.